very happy to be able to introduce uh, Tom Contia to us uh, tonight. It turns out this is this is Contia's first time in London, and I'm very happy to to be able to um, be a part of a first time in London and a first visit to the British Museum, and unfortunately not to the Southeast Asia collections, but to the the South Asia mm -hmm. collections today. So. Um, it's, it's a real pleasure for us to be able to host a, um, a Khmer scholar, a Cambodian studies scholar. Kuntia uh, probably does not e need an introduction for most of you. Um, she is, I will nonetheless give you a brief one. Uh, she completed an MA, well, uh, the bachelor's degree in Phnom Penh at the, at the University of Fine Arts. No, uh, at the uh, University, of Phnom Penh. University of Phnom Penh. Mm -hmm and then an MA in Bodh Gaya, and then a PhD at the École Pratique des Études in, in Paris. She works specifically, as I'm sure most of you know, on, um, on ancient Khmer epigraphy, ancient Khmer language, and it's, it's in, in particular its relationship to Sanskrit and the incorporation of Sanskrit, uh, Sanskrit terminology, Sanskrit uh, uh, attendant co concepts, this sort of thing. So um, tonight we'll be getting a taste of that, as I understand it. Uh, working specifically on questions of education in ancient, ancient Cambodia and the Sanskrit root into that, um, and no doubt the Sanskritic nature of that in many ways. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes, please, please uh, join me in welcoming Kuntia tonight. And uh, we will, I understand that Kuntia will be speaking for about 45 minutes or so, and then we'll have an, an open uh, question and answer session. So, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So thank you very much, Professor Ashley Thompson, and uh, good evening, everyone. So I like to sincerely thank uh, SWAS for inviting me to give a talk today, and thank you for all of you for coming. I'll try to make my presentation as um, interesting as possible. Uh, I'm going to talk about Sanskritic education in ancient Cambodia. By Sanskritic, I mean what is related to the uh, typical civilization of Sanskrit texts and expressions. It is important to recall that Cambodia or Kampuchea Desh is one of the ancient states which had uh, written documents in Sanskrit and they form a world which uh, Sheldon Pollock calls Sanskrit Cosmopolis. It covers mainly South Asia and Southeast Asia. In this part of the world, from the first centuries to the uh, 14th century, Sanskrit was the language of religious scriptures, philosophical uh, treatises and ritual handbooks, as well as instruction manuals on politics, warfare, social organization, and many aspects of cultivated living. Be, uh, because of the vast literature written in Sanskrit, the language became, as uh, Sheldon Pollock uh, remarked, an essential component of power in the Cambodia dish like anywhere else in the Sanskrit cosmopolis. So uh, you can see the, um, I don't need to uh, tell you because uh, you can uh, recognize. So I mean, uh, this part, uh, well, I cannot see it clearly myself, but uh, this is uh, what uh, we mean by uh, Sanskrit cosmopolis. Oh, sorry, don't forget the uh, Indonesia, the uh, Java and uh, all the rest. So uh, inscriptions from uh, ancient Cambodia are important sources to reconstruct the history of the country. Now about um, 1,400 uh, 1, inscriptions have been inventoried and written between the 6th and the 14th century of the Common Era. They are found in the present day Cambodia, Laos, Thailand and Vietnam as you can see uh, uh, on the map. And uh, they are known either by their provenance or their K number. This map shows the number of inscriptions found in 50 provinces of the four countries. As far as language is concerned, the inscriptions can be classified into three main categories. Inscriptions in Sanskrit, inscriptions in Old Khmer, and inscriptions in Sanskrit and Old Khmer. Inscriptions are mostly on stone and found in temples. Out of the 1,400 uh, 1, texts, about 70 inscriptions which contain names and um, uh, name of uh, literary works and also the information related to education are treated in my study. Uh, 
um, epigraphy from ancient Cam uh, Cambodia are uh, exploited uh, actually in order to understand the history of straight, uh, statecraft, religion, art, and so forth. Uh, yet the Sanskrit language and the Sanskritic uh, sciences which nourish the um, religion, art, etc. seem to be insufficiently studied. In other words, we have paid a lot of attention to the result of the sanctification of Cambodia dish, but not the process. Uh, the civilization of uh, the kingdom uh, Cambodia dish would not have been survived from 6th to the 14th century without a firm tradition of transmission of knowledge or a well system, uh, systematized uh, education, systemized education, sorry. Our aim is to identify what type of knowledge it was and examine how knowledge was transmitted from one generation to another. As already mentioned in the previous slide, about 70 inscriptions are our sources. The information related to education is rare because uh, epigraphy is uh, intended to record eulogy and genealogy of kings and elites. Uh, detail of uh, religion endowment such as donation of land, servant, etc. But in order to get the information which can be uh, useful for our research on uh, education, we have to read between the lines and explore also the archaeological findings. It is important to notice also that our scope of study can reach only the formal type of education. And uh, since our data comes on, uh, mainly from Sanskrit inscriptions and Khmer inscriptions, which have a lot of Sanskrit loanwords, so the formal education was Sanskrit oriented or Sanskrit. Uh, in my lecture, we are going to do uh, four things. One, names of uh, tex uh, textbooks will be presented. And two, the Sanskrit term ashrama, which is um, usually translated into English as hermitage, and the expression pustaka ashrama, book hermitage, uh, literally, uh, will be re examined. And three, the tradition of knowledge transmission from teachers to students and among family members will be discussed. Last, uh, four, number four, we will explore how and to what extent the Hindu model of education with Sanskrit as its pillar was localized in ancient Cambodia. Uh, we will do this with special reference to the medium uh, language of the teaching. <coughs> and some of you may notice that the order is different from the one I put in my abstract. I'm sorry for the change, but I believe that the new order will make my talk more comprehensible. So now uh, we come to the first point, names of textbooks. In epigraphy, a learned uh, person was often qualified as he who has crossed the ocean of innumerable sciences, or the master of all sciences, or the recipient of diverse sciences. The Sanskrit term for science is shastra, and derived from the verbal root shast to teach, it means literary, a means of teaching. It conveys indeed the same meaning as the German term Lehrtext. Uh, literally uh, in English, um, it is teaching text, or we can call textbook. And where, uh, what were the textbook of the Khmer people that we are going to see uh, soon in the next few slides? Uh, Sanskrit is known to have been used uh, during the period from three, uh, 1500 BC to around uh, 1300 uh, of the Common Era. And the body of uh, Sanskrit literature encompasses a rich tradition of scientific, technical, philosophical, and religious text. Text names which you are familiar with, uh, such as Vedas, Upanishads, Mahabharata, Ramayana, and so forth have been composed in Sanskrit. Here I select only the main scriptures and treatises which have connection with Cambodia. As you can see, um, we have Rigveda, Yajur Veda, you know, all the four Vedas, 
and uh, uh, Brahmana Zhong, Aranyaka Zhong, and uh, Upanishad Zhong, uh, Dharma Sutra, Ashtadhyayi for grammar, and then the two epics, Mahabharata and Ramayana, and uh, very important, the Arata Shastra. Um, next, uh, Mahabhasya, Manusmriti, um, and also the Purana Zhong, especially uh, Vayu, Vishnu, and uh, Matsya. And also we have the medicine uh, science uh, textbook uh, that's called uh, Ayurveda and Surya Siddhanta in uh, astrology. And the last, um, we have some Hika, architecture for architecture. So in the Sanskrit inscription from Cambodia, names of uh, treatises and sciences were hinted in the Yol logistic uh, words and philosophical uh, or religious texts in the stanzas of invocation. The Khmer inscriptions, on the other hand, record fewer names of uh, treatises in the places of uh, elite or in the juridical context. Here, um, the um, inscrip uh, Sanskrit inscription of uh, pre-Angkorian and Angkorian periods provide considerable information of intellectual uh, quality of uh, protagonists of the main uh, people. The stanza 20 of the uh, inscription from Bantiei Srei, K 842, uh, for instance, informs us that an eminent servant, um, uh, namely Yachinya Varaha, had a good command of uh, yoga philosophy, Vaisheshik philosophy, uh, Samkhya philosophy and Nyaya philosophy, as well as the Buddhism, the medicine, the music, and the astrology. So here I just uh, give you a good example where in one uh, stanza we can have uh, a lot of a lot of names of um, uh, shastra or sciences or scriptures. So uh, all together, uh, according to the preliminary results of our survey, a dozen of names of sciences uh, of uh, scriptures is known from pre-Angkorian uh, Prashasti. And in Angkorian time, the number rises up to about uh, 50. Moreover, if we consider the sciences and scriptures which are not directly mentioned, uh, but are alluded to in the Sanskrit inscription from Cambodia, we have to add about uh, 20 more names of scriptures and uh, a dozen names of uh, authors or founders of literary works or uh, doctrines. Uh, it is probable that we overlook some inscriptions in Sanskrit um, which make reference to religious or philosophical texts or other form of literature. You know, the in, uh, indexes which uh, help us to find the names of sciences or uh, scriptures vary from one inscription to another. In some uh, cases, the indexes are relatively weak, whereas in some others, they appear to be convincing. Um, the stanza 4 of the inscription of uh, Virgantai, uh, K359 of uh, 7th century, for instance, uses the word uh, Purana like that in singular form. And uh, this um, induces us to take it for the Vayu Purana, which is the oldest text of the Purana genre. Now, I just load you with all the names of the sciences, uh, the, um, uh, about 70 names of uh, scriptures and, you know, sciences, uh, in alphabetical order, uh, Sanskrit alphabetical order, um, and uh, they are mentioned explicitly and um, implicitly in Sanskrit and Khmer inscriptions. And the uh, sciences and scriptures are among the fundamental texts of the Sanskrit literature, which consists of uh, scientific, uh, technical, philosophical, and religious texts if we uh, just want to uh, summarize that. So here, um, they can be grouped in the following fields. You know, uh, it is uh, by basing on this science that the Khmer kings uh, could manage their 
politics. The poets could compose their inscriptions of high quality, and then the astrologers could uh, calculate time. The architects could build temples, and uh, priests could conduct their rituals. So um, we can, uh, how to say, just focus on uh, six points: you know, philosophy and religion, statecraft, art, which cover architecture, music, dance, and prosody, and then medicine and uh, astronomy, astrology, and mathematics. The last is uh, linguistics, especially uh, grammar. And uh, here, they are the, among the names of the scriptures, the grammar, the juridical uh, treatise called the uh, Dharma Shastra, the Four Veda, the Epic Mahabharata and uh, Ramayana, the Shaiva scriptures and the text of Purana Zhong are the most frequently cited in the inscriptions. And they are uh, probably um, the most uh, common textbooks which were passed down from pre Angkorian to Angkorian time. You know, among the 70 uh, scriptures, we can see um, very often these texts. So now I move to the second point of my uh, presentation about two terms, uh, Ashrama and Pustaka Ashrama. Uh, besides the textbook which were religious oriented, the epigraphy also informs that schools were located in Ashrama. In Sanskrit, Ashrama has two main meanings. One is a hermitage and two is a stage of a religious life of a Brahman. There are more than 300 occurrences of the term ashrama in about 100 inscriptions uh, from ancient Cambodia. In Cambodian epigraphy, mostly the first meaning is referred to. In his uh, dictionary, Philip Jenner sticks to the literal meaning of the term as hermitage by giving at the same time three uh, functions of the ashrama. One, uh, hermitage as the residence of clerics. Two, hermitage as the seat of religious order. And three, hermitage as the institution of learning, that means school or college, just like uh, we have in the present, I mean, modern time. Uh, the three functions remind us of uh, those already mentioned in uh, Saurus Food's groundbreaking article um, entitled Ashrama Dong Long Siem Kambosh, published in 2002. In the article, she emphasizes the similarity between an ashrama in Angkor period and a Wat uh, or Buddhist monastery in the post Angkorian period as a place of worship, hospitality, and education. She divides ashrama into two types one um, is uh, individual ashrama, and uh, two is uh, another one, uh, communal ashrama. Contrary to the individual ashrama, which was for retreat from the material world, the uh, communal ashrama was supposed to be a residence of many teachers and students, a kind of college. And she adds that the individual ashrama uh, appeared in the pre angkorian inscriptions, whereas the college-like ashrama was known only in uh, Angkorian time, especially under the reign of King Yashovarman of late 9th century. And uh, this king um, um, is very important for the study of the education because he established 100 ashrama. You know, he alone, uh, only in his reign, one reign alone, uh, he established the 100 ashrama across the kingdom. And four of his ashrama uh, were in the city and uh, they, they were called Vaishnava ashrama, Saugata ashrama, Maheshwara Ashrama and Brahmana Ashrama. The, um, they are called according to the sect, the religious sect, like uh, for um, Vaishnava Ashrama that is um, uh, dedicated to Lord Vishnu and uh, Saugata Ashrama for Lord, uh, for the Buddha. And the last two, Maheshwara Ashrama and Brahmana Ashrama, they were for uh, Shiva, for the devout, um, for the devotees of uh, Shiva. So um, a lot has been um, 
has been known about ashrama from um, Sagru school article and other recent researches. Now, what um, I would like to do is to uh, add two points to the scholarship. One is that um, ashrama were places of learning, but not all the places of learning were called <coughs> ashrama. And two, uh, ashrama play crucial role in the production of written texts you know, inscriptions and uh, manuscripts without which we uh, would not, uh, how to say, have means to uh, know the history of ancient Cambodia. So uh, these texts are very important and Ashrama played very important role, the crucial role in that, uh, in that uh, matter. Um, there were colleges uh, at that time which were named uh, with Sanskrit words uh, other than ashrama. Like I gave you the example of the ashrama of Yashovarman. Uh, um, they were called Vaishnava Ashrama, Saugata Ashrama. That means uh, the name uh, ends with ashrama. But there were many uh, other ashramas which uh, uh, got the name without the term ashrama. And uh, they were with uh, some names, which um, some some words, which uh, mean uh, more or less a boat or dwelling place. Like uh, here we have a uh, nivas uh, example, Bhadreshwara um, nivas, and also uh, the word uh, the name ends with uh, avas, rudravas, for example, and alaya, yogeshwara alaya. Uh, and also Pat in uh, Sankranta Pat and last uh, Vihara, like in uh, Raja Vihara. So um, there were also names of colleges uh, which uh, had the um, same name and which were named after the main divinities of the temples. The example uh, I gave here is Sri Bhuvana Maheshwara which uh, is identified as the uh, Bangkit Sri Temple uh, in the present day Siem uh, province of uh, Cambodia. And another type is the um, ashrama or the colleges, which did not have their names recorded in inscriptions. So um, here we have, uh, for example, Prasatna, which was, uh, I could imagine that uh, maybe one of the biggest ashrama and the most uh, active ashrama ever in uh, the history of uh, Cambodia, but uh, we could not find the uh, ancient name of this ashrama, unfortunately, so we just call it by the present day name of Prasatna. And um, let's see this one which is also important, Raja Vihara. You know, among uh, all uh, the ashramas, Raja Vihara um, seems to be also the most important and the biggest. Uh, it is identified to be the temple of uh, Taprum in Angkor complex, and it was specialized in medicine. There were, according to the stela, the foundation stela uh, of the temple, there were 439 religious men, or uh, it's Sanskrit term Dharma Dharina, and 970 students, uh, Adjetri Vasinaha, living in the temple uh, premises. They worked under the supervision of a professor called Ajapak. So, you know, at that time, at least 1,410 persons lived in the temple and depended on the endowment of royal treasure and other sources. I don't know, uh, I don't know how many students in source, but <laughs> in uh, uh, the ashrama, the college of uh, Taprum temple, there were 1,410. Uh, ashrama were active in the production of uh, written documents in durable and perishable materials. Poets and scribes were trained there, epigraphs and manuscripts uh, were produced there as well. From the beginning of its history, Cambodia showed much interest in scripts uh, which were brought from the Indian uh, subcontinent. King Yashovarman of the late 9th century and his great-grandson Yachinyavaraha of the second half of the 10th century, for instance, 
were experts in scripts. We learn from the stella of the ashrama of King Yashovaraman that each of his ashrama employed two scribes and two librarians. You know, while uh, dedicating themselves to writing, the Khmer people seemed to turn against the traditional Indian, especially the Brahmanical culture, which gave pri uh, priority to the spoken rather than the written word. And the culture is best explained by the proverb in Sanskrit, Pustakasthatuya Vidya Parahastagatam Thanam Karyakale Samutpane Nasa Vidya Natadhanam Meaning knowledge is uh, not called knowledge when it is only in book. And money is not money when it is in the hands of others. So you know that uh, the, the tradition, uh, traditional uh, Indian thought is like that. So you have to put everything in your head and also in your mouth whenever you want to use, you recite it. But us in Cambodia, we, we you know, we turn, uh, we had the tendency to uh, write because uh, we cannot, uh, how to say, see knowledge uh, abstract like that. So we have to see the book as the symbol of knowledge, something uh, uh, some, uh, symbolic. So to my people, um, writing was a, I mean, a prestigious act and copying of a sacred text uh, of and donation of uh, manuscripts to temples were often uh, mentioned in inscriptions. Dominic Goodall in his uh, article published in 2017 draws our attention to the uh, inscription of Beer Contain, which we saw just now also, K359, um, very early uh, 7th century, as the earliest example of donation of physical books, or pustaka, uh, the Sanskrit term, to a temple. And he also notes that the Indian allusions to the copying of specific texts or to the maintenance of uh, manuscripts of them appear not only to be very uh, rare, but also to date from some centuries later than this 7th century uh, Cambodian inscription. So the attitude um, toward writing made a lot of difference. I mean, the books were treated differently from the Indic world. I mean, in Cambodia, um, they were treated differently from uh, the Indic world. And um, uh, we are going to see this in the next uh, section uh, about Pusaka Shrama. Uh, here, um, I would like just to underline that the sciences mentioned above were known in Cambodia not only as uh, something abstract or intangible, but you know, um, as something which has a physical representation or tangible. So we have some examples here on bar reliefs and uh, sculptures. Here you have a beautiful Lokeshwara with 10 arms from Bantichma Temple, late 12th, early 13th century. And the uh, manuscript in his one of his hands is here. Second example, also a Lokeshwara from East Gate of uh, Angkor Thom, the same period, late 12th, early 13th century. And you can even see, you know, a bun of, I mean, the manuscript um, was like a bun of uh, palm leaves, not only uh, one one uh, page, but there are over many. The same here, but it is a, a female divinity, Pratnya Paramita from Bantiechma, but of the same period. Here uh, we have uh, one. Um, um, from, as you can see, Bantia Minche province and uh, earlier than the previous uh, um, examples. Um, <coughs> this of early 11th century. And on the same uh, boundary uh, post, there were also a female divinity, Pragna Paramita. So there were uh, Lokeshwara, and I put Pragna Paramita in. Uh, I mean, with question mark because it's maybe uh, some other divinities. And we have some small uh, 
Barilis on temples, which um, I don't know whether to take them as the representation of uh, manuscripts. Here you can see the first picture. Um, it is from Phnom Rung in uh, Thailand, and this one uh, from Bai Yuan Temple. And this um, can be uh, in uh, Baku because I have not uh, checked yet. I just uh, took it from a publication. Here, some more photos. So from the shape of the manuscript, we assume that they were written on uh, palm leaves tied together in bundles rather than on other materials. You know, according to uh, epigraphical and Chinese sources, there were two types of uh, materials used in uh, ancient time, the blackened deer skin leather and palm leaf. And here, um, I like to show you some uh, photos of uh, manuscripts in contemporary Cambodia. And uh, you can see um, some similarity with the presentation in the uh, 11th century or uh, 12th century uh, photos. You see uh, the, I mean, the statues uh, we just seen. So although the history of uh, materials used for writing in Cambodia is to be studied in details, uh, I can say that the techniques of the production of the palm leaf manuscript today are to some extent inherited from those of the time of King uh, Yasho Varman at least. Now we come to uh, Pustaka Shrama, the place. Uh, you know, we learn from the epigraphy that the books or Pustaka uh, were kept in libraries and the library uh, were called Pustaka Shama. And the library, we also know that they were in the temple's uh, premises. And uh, actually, there were two 10th century Sanskrit uh, inscriptions, K958 from Prasad Kukcho and uh, K355 from Prasad Kna, which uh, record that a certain Hiranya Ruchi established a Pustaka Shama. Here uh, are two photos of the building, you know, uh, which can be identified as the Pustaka Shama because um, on one of the door frame, I don't know how to show. on one of the door frame, the, the inscription just say, um, you know, here is the library, Pustaka Shama. Uh, in the second literature, the term um, uh, library or in French, bibliothèque is uh, systematically used to refer to the annexed buildings which are located to the east of the towers and open to the west. For example, on the plan of um, Temple of uh, Preco, this one, you can see uh, here a so-called library uh, at the southeast corner and it is a small building uh, in brick uh, with holes on the walls, similar to that of uh, Prasadkna, which we just uh, saw. Uh, unlike the case of Prasadkna, which has an inscription on the door frame uh, to uh, state that uh, it was called Pustaka Shama, the library of uh, Preko is called like that without a strong basis. So, a doubt. It is, uh, we have to question this. Uh, it is interesting that the, uh, ash, uh, the term ashrama in the expression uh, pustaka ashrama uh, was used to refer to a particular uh, annexed building of the temple, not to the temple as the whole. And that, uh, that building was reserved for books because uh, we have the word pustaka, books. Um, but we don't know its exact function. I mean, the function of the shrine, the... the um, uh, structure. Was it a resting place of books as translated by uh, Dominic Goodall? You know, although this uh, translation is safer than library, uh, it does not explain more about how the books were treated inside. And uh, researchers usually think that the holes in the walls were conceived for light and ventilation. Some assume that cults of fire were practiced there. Um, since we have no basis to exclude the hypothesis, 
the that the fire uh, ritual is uh, in that um, uh, library building. So we suppose that there were book and fire ritual, but there was not all. There were more. In the case of a uh, Preco temple, we also have uh, a frieze of nine divinities or nine planets on the eastern wall of the building. Here, uh, it was placed about uh, 20 centimeters higher than the uh, floor level. But in the photo, uh, the floor is uh, hipped up to the extent that we hardly see the frieze. Although it is in bad condition, the traces are clear enough to confirm the existence of the nine planets. We wonder if the books in the building were there to be worshipped along with the divinities by the presence of the fire. I suggest that a kind of book ritual was uh, practiced in ancient Cambodia to take place uh, in that building. And taking uh, into consideration that the type of uh, Pustaka Shama building was very rare, not to say unknown in uh, South Asia, and that writing was very much honored in Cambodia, so the cult of books was not impossible. There were, uh, there may be more objects than book, fire ritual, and the nine divinities. Uh, we hope to learn uh, more about this in the forthcoming article by uh, two Indian scholars, uh, whom Peter uh, know, uh, Swati Chamburka and Shivani Kapoor. So now I come to the um, third point, tradition of knowledge transmission. The inscriptions from uh, ancient Cambodia or Kampuchadesh counting from the reign of uh, King Gunavarman, late 5th, early uh, 6th century, to King Jayavarman Parameshwara, first half of the 14th century, mention a considerable number of scholars. And the majority of scholars were elites. They could be divided into four groups as uh, follows. One, uh, priests <coughs> or religious people, two kings and queens, three are the members of the royal family, and four officers in royal court. And I give you uh, each for each uh, group some uh, some names, some uh, people, like uh, for religious people, you can see uh, Vidya Vishesha, Shiva Som, and um, kings and queens, you can quote King Yasho Varman, Rajendra Varman, uh, the king um, Jaya Raj Devi, and for other members, uh, we have Dora Goswami, son in law of King <coughs> Ishan Varman, Jachinya Varman, great grandson of King Yasho Varman, and for officers in royal court, uh, we know Madhya Desha, a woman, Janapadna, also a woman. Um, the high quality of the inscriptions as well as the archaeological vestige uh, suggests that the Khmer uh, have certainly learned the Sanskrit language and the Sanskritic uh, sciences with competent uh, professors and uh, in family or Kula in Sanskrit, uh, the term in Sanskrit. Kula can mean a family and house. In the Cambodian epigraphy, two important is, uh, expressions are coined with the term Kula. We have uh, Kulapati and uh, uh, Kula Vidya. Kulapati has many um, synonyms like Kula Antipa and uh, Kula Jaksha, uh, master of a religious uh, community or abode, and uh, Kula Vidya, signs of um, family. In the context of uh, Ashrama of Yashovarman, Kulapati was the head of the scholars in the Ashram. Uh, I understand the expression Kulavidja, science of family, as knowledge imparted from father to son or among members of the family. Um, for example, Simhadatta was one of the learned Brahmins uh, under the reign of King Jayavarman I. And he was a doctor or vajra. 
It seems that his uh, medical knowledge was transmitted from his father. We know that he had two great grand uncles who were also doctors or physicians in uh, the court of King Rudravarman, uh, 514 to 550. So that was a family of doctors. Uh, Kula or family could also take its large uh, sense as a big spiritual kin. Uh, Kula Vidya may refer to the sciences transmitted from master to uh, disciples of a college. Like um, here, you can see um, Shiva Soma, Vama Shiva, and Nandika Charya constituted an exemplar exemplary uh, knowledge transmission line or parampara. We call parampara in uh, Sanskrit. Uh, Shiva Soma was a cousin of King Jayavarman uh, II and royal preceptor of King Indra Varman. And from uh, his childhood, he sought scholars before becoming a disciple of uh, Professor uh, Bhagavad Rudra, uh, who was the recipient of all sciences and may be a disciple of a renowned Indi uh, Indian philosopher, Shankaracharya, uh, end of uh, 8th and early 9th century. Uh, taking into consideration their dates, we have to uh, take this in a uh, figurative sense. That means um, either Shankaracharya was not the direct teacher of Bhagavad Rudra or um, there were another Shankaracharya. So I put a question mark there. And uh, Shiva Soma had uh, Vama Shiva as student. Um, he became also a priest of um, Hotar type, you know, there were many types of priests, so he was a Hotar of King uh, Indra Varman, and uh, he was also the teacher of the young prince Yasho Varadhan, who later on became the uh, King Yasho Varman. And in his turn, Vama Shiva transmitted his knowledge to uh, Nandika Charya, a rigorous ascetic who also served in the court of uh, King Indra Varman as a priest of Acharya type. Nandika Acharya became later on the chief of all the Acharya and the royal preceptor of King Yashovarman. So the Parampara uh, can be uh, represented like uh, what you see on the slide. And um, this king, the last uh, member, King Yashovarman, uh, does not seem to be engaged in any uh, teaching task uh, in Ashrama, but his 100 Ashrama project contributed a lot to the development of uh, Sanskrit culture in Cambodia. And his reign is a watershed in the history of uh, Sanskrit scholarship in Cambodia, which reaches its peak in the reign of King Rajendra Varman, 944-968. The Sanskrit inscription from uh, Prairu Temple composed in 961 which excels even the Sanskrit inscription in the uh, India itself is uh, to be considered as the result of the effort made by King Yashovarman about half a century earlier. So this uh, great king for the Sanskrit uh, scholarship. Oh, now I come to the last point, uh, localization of uh, Sanskrit education and I uh, focus on the medium uh, language. We have uh, mentioned earlier that um, there were some characteristics of Cambodian education, such as the tendency towards uh, writing and a kind of book cult in uh, the Pustaka Shama. In this section uh, of the lecture, I uh, am going to raise only two more points. One is the name of text having the Khmer prefix Bra, and the second one, uh, the Khmer as medium language. Uh, among the common textbooks presented in the first half of uh, the lecture, hand names of the sciences and scriptures are mentioned in a dozen of uh, Khmer inscriptions, uh, which were uh, which are dated or datable of 10th and 12th century. They are uh, called Guya, Dharma Shastra, uh, Nayotara, Vinashika, Vishnu Dharma, uh, Vyakaran, Shiksha, Shirashtheda, Samoha, and Siddhanta. The mention of the names of the sciences and uh, scriptures in uh, Khmer inscriptions 
uh, may suggest that they were popular than those which appear only the Sanskrit text. Being used by the Khmer people, the sciences have uh, adopted some uh, aspects of Khmerness. And one of the aspects is the prefix vra, meaning divine uh, or royal being or object uh, occurring as a head word of a noun phrase. Uh, in other words, uh, the term is used in front of lexical uh, elements to turn them into sacred elements. Uh, it is used uh, for cult objects like Brahko, um, Sacred House, Brahdakshina, Brahtnam, uh, and Brahshatna. We have the translation uh, on the slide. And the uh, um, important thing is that it is also used with names of scriptures such as Brah um, Vishnu Dharma and Brah Dharma Shastra. Uh, reciting the sacred uh, juridical text Dharma Shastra was a common practice in the uh, juridical system of the kingdom. Hence, the frequent uh, occurrence of the expression Sot Pre uh, Thomasa. And by uh, comparing the context in which the name Dharma Shastra or Thomasa in the uh, Khmer pronunciation uh, appears with and without the prefix Vra. Uh, I come to the conclusion that the Vra Dharma Shastra was perhaps a certain version of the treatise which was circulated in Cambodia. And since it, uh, since it was recited in the court of justice for public, so the Vra Dharma Shastra may be a Khmer version of the Dharma Shastra orig uh, originally in Sanskrit. One cannot deny the uh, existence of uh, manuscripts in Khmer language which were composed for the sake of local people and students, especially the beginners, although the composition has disappeared since many centuries. Uh, the use of the term Vra to indicate a name of a, script, a scripture or treatise reminds us of the use of the Sanskrit term Sri. According to uh, Munir William, the word Sri means uh, sacred holy is uh, frequently uh, used as an honorific prefix to the names of divinities, the names of eminent per uh, persons, uh, as well as the name of celebrated work and sacred objects. Uh, for example, here we have Sri Bhagavad Gita. Uh, that, um, the term Sri is added to the name of the book Bhagavad Gita. The relation uh, between the Khmer term bra with the Sanskrit uh, word Sri is underlined by uh, Philip Jenner, uh, stating that the Khmer term is perhaps a calc on uh, Sanskrit Sri, that is uh, the, um, how to say, translation, um, the imitation from uh, Sanskrit Sri. The word calc uh, here may refer to the notion which the term bra borrows from the word uh, Sri in Sanskrit. Both the terms Bra and Sri designate the sacredness of the divinity, human being, objects, and textual compositions. Uh, in in uh, inscriptions composed between the uh, 10th to 12th century mention two Khmer terms, uh, Barian, to teach, or Rian, to study. And um, the Khmer was the mother tongue of the students and maybe also of the teachers. So the teaching of the Sanskrit text was probably in uh, the vernacular language Khmer. The sacred uh, language from India was, I mean Sanskrit, was adopted by the Khmer as a written language and or language of epigraphy and manuscripts. And this language, uh, Sanskrit, remained a written language during the whole existence in uh, the ancient Cambodia. The disciples who, uh, whose knowledge of Sanskrit was not as good as that of their masters would learn the Sanskrit text with the help of a gloss or uh, an explanation in their mother tongue. So the situation was similar to the education of the Buddhist canonic text in Pali of the post-Angkorian period, 15th to uh, 18th century. Translations and commentaries in the vernacular language called Samurai were known in that uh, period. 
uh, let's consider um, a description of teaching environment as evidence from a, a Sanskrit inscription from Prasadhana K661, uh, late 10th, early 11th century. It is about classes of a professor, namely uh, Shal or uh, Jayendra Pandit. He taught in many ashrama. He set much higher than his students who were uh, most probably seated on the ground. He also uh, taught all sciences to students and organized also discussion sessions with them. Uh, his explanation was so good that the student took him as the author of the books. Outside classrooms, he received his uh, learned colleagues in order to answer uh, their questions. Moreover, relatives of students invited him in order to ask uh, for clarifications of some passages uh, in some uh, scriptures. He could explain clearly even the books he, that he uh, had not read. So the inscription, I mean this um, passage of the inscription is very important because it sheds light on the verbal contact in academic milieu. I may be wrong to say that the teacher's discussions, explanations, answers, and clarifications were in Khmer, the everyday life of the people, and that Khmer was the mother tongue of the, those people, of the teachers and the, his uh, entourage. But you know, to imagine that the medium language of the teaching was Sanskrit sounds just more groundless to me. So I uh, still stick to the, the idea that the, the medium uh, language was uh, Khmer. Now, to sum up, we have an uh, answer to what, where, who, and how uh, the Sanskritic knowledge was uh, imparted in the Khmer <coughs> world. The Khmer people participated actively in the Sanskritization movement of uh, their time and apparently did not hesitate to adapt what they have uh, they had picked up from the Indic world to their need and taste. The number of uh, sciences and scriptures shows that the Sanskrit, uh, Sanskrit culture was deep-rooted in Cambodia. To get the whole picture of the Sanskrit education seems impossible because some information, such as the content of the palm leaf uh, manuscripts, has lost. So many pieces of the puzzle have been lost. I have found few pieces of the puzzle and continue to search for more. Indeed, I am working uh, with two Cambodian uh, colleagues, Dr. Chaim Rathi and uh, Dr. Leng Pirum, to publish a book chapter on this subject soon, hopefully next year. Uh, I will end my presentation with this uh, photo of sages or rishi in uh, Angkor time. Many of them were polyvalent teachers and they mastered religious uh, scriptures, political science and martial arts among other sciences. They were, you know, the pillars of the education in ancient time. They were famous even today. You know, uh, any Cambodian would describe a rishi or Thai say in Khmer language as an old hermit living in his ashrama in the forest with a servant. And then he taught uh, various sciences to young princes who came all the way from the city uh, to his ashrama. Like uh, if you know the story of um, uh, Ramayana, Rama, uh, he went to learn the um, uh, sciences from um, his uh, guru, Vishma Mitra. So thank you very much for your kind attention and for bearing my English. There are, uh, of course, many shortcomings in my uh, lecture and uh, suggestions and corrections are most welcome. So please uh, tell me now or write to me uh, later on uh, by this email. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, Cynthia. We, we have time for questions. Yes, please. Yes. Um, you said that you thought the apogee of San, uh, Sanskrit culture, mm -hmm. cosmopolis in Cambodia, was under Rajendra Bhatma. Uh, what is the evidence for that? And secondly, his son, mm -hmm. uh, Jaya Varma V, 
actually constructed many Buddhist ashrama, uh, according to the Wat Sator inscription. So that presumably was maintaining this high level. Yes. Um, and then uh, the Vickery always, Martin, uh, 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 Vickery always talked about Sanskrit being revived under Jai Varman the second, uh, the seventh, sorry, mm -hmm. with his wife, the famous Sanskritist, writing many inscriptions, his two sons writing inscriptions. Um, but Vickery says it was very much a revival then. So there's presumably a dip between Rajendra yeah, Varman, Jai Varman uh, fifth, and so, so in the uh, the Mahidara Kora uh, period, Dynasty, yes. yeah, Surya Varman the first and Udayaditya Varman, there was less less evidence of Sanskrit. Okay, so that's all. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you very much for the question, and it is uh, very important because uh, it's just like you want to know the whole, how to say, uh, the important times in the uh, uh, ashrama. Um, uh, culture. Um, as I, I think I have. Well, I don't remember which slide. But um, we talk about the article by uh, Saurus Fu. So she um, emphasizes. She uh, noticed one um, important point that there were two ashrama, one individual ashrama where one rishi, you know, uh, he lived and he did his uh, asceticism alone like that. Uh, he uh, wanted to, um, how to say, take a retreat from the world, but there were um, that was in uh, Angkorian time. So we uh, had only, you know, the individual ashrama in Angkorian time, and those uh, ashrama uh, were not very uh, useful or very uh, active for uh, the uh, uh, knowledge transmitting. But only in the reign of uh, King uh, Yasho Varman that is uh, late uh, 9th century, that we, we had this, uh, his, um, you know, booming uh, project of uh, ashrama, the 100 uh, ashrama, that um, somehow it pushed very uh, far the uh, culture, Sanskrit culture in Cambodia. And like uh, you mentioned, in the reign of uh, King Rajendra Varman, uh, uh, how to say evidence from uh, inscription from uh, Wat Sito, that also we, we had you know a lot of um, how to say uh, examples and and um, yes um, uh, many existence we know uh, the existence of uh, many ashrama and um, after uh, Rajendra Varman then we had uh, Jai Varman the fifth also he was uh, 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 very keen of uh, Sanskrit learning but then later on um, during the uh, next the reign of the uh, successors of uh, Jai Varman the fifth, we, um, how to say, we did not um, get any uh, good inscriptions or the inscription which uh, tell about the Sanskrit scholarship. So we assume that uh, there was somehow a fall in the learning uh, among the Khmer people. And uh, you also uh, mentioned that only in the reign of uh, Jai Varman the seventh, you know, somehow uh, it was um, politi um, how to say, for the political reason also, then he, this king, he um, uh, started again to use Sanskrit because he wanted to show, you know, not only um, uh, to give message to the people in Cambodia, but to show also the neighboring states. You know, Sanskrit at that time was like English now, I mean, that, that was the movement uh, to, uh, how to say, to become powerful through the inscriptions because uh, the more you write then the more uh, people uh, know you so that's how I uh, see things and this may, may be in some ways a related question um, I was very interested in the the distinction you were making between the, the figurative and the literal you spoke about it in relationship first to the parampara yes right so maybe we're rather than saying, rather than interpreting the, the textual evidence to demonstrate to us that there's an actual guru and an actual disciple, that it's more the notion of following this almost mythical, nonetheless historic guru. So in terms of the parampara, but also in terms of the book cult, it seems mm -hmm. to me that's a useful distinction for understanding something that's going on between learning and 
the book as a sacred object of veneration. Mm -hmm. And in your art historical, in many of your art historical uh, examples, this, for example, we would be potentially looking not at a representation of learning per se, as we might think of it, yeah. but as a representation of the, the attribute, um, the, the book as yes, a, a sacred object, which yeah. is an attribute and which is more mm -hmm. in the order of the symbolic than on the order of learning. Um, so I'm wondering what evidence you track to think about that distinction. So mm -hmm. even in, you know, let's let's go to Prasat Kana, where we've got the Pushtakashrama, yes. right? We've got a, a resting place for books. Yeah. What would allow us there to think of this as a site of learning as opposed to a site of veneration of an object, which is a book? Right? Yes, yes. And uh, here, uh, yes, thank you very much for your your uh, remarks and also, you know, um, ideas. Um, I I do agree that um, we have very, how to say, weak uh, proof or very weak um, uh, pieces evidence. of inf yeah, evidence, uh, in very uh, uh, small uh, information to, to really, uh, how to say, um, from there, we can uh, do um, or uh, prove, um, show a good picture of the education. But um, you, um, how to say, um, notice rightly that uh, the, um, how to say, the world they live uh, in the past was somehow dominated by the religious uh, concern. I mean, everything was for God. Either Shiva, Vishnu, Brahma, you know, any god. Just I, I think uh, the similar uh, situation uh, was like uh, in Europe until you know, uh, 15 or 16th century. That you just uh, how to say, um, um, I mean, the education or the sciences was uh, somehow related to the re uh, religion. I mean, you you uh, cannot uh, split the two, and. Um, that uh, how uh, to say um, the Pustakashrama was a place for learning or for keeping books, I mean, for academic uh, purpose rather than for uh, a cult. That is indeed what I'm trying to say. You know, you, uh, even though they call it uh, Pustakashrama, which, you know, immediately uh, just make us the uh, Sanskritists think that okay it is the uh, library yeah but it might be not that that is uh, I'm trying to but uh, still I really need uh, more uh, proof to to say that somehow it was um, you know always there was this uh, religion behind you you cannot I mean, just think that, that it the is the rise um, and fall of composition of, of the panegyric composition is perhaps evidence towards a system of education uh, predominating at certain times, or at least expanding itself beyond the culture of the book um, at certain times. So that's, I, I wonder about that as possible evidence. But I do also wonder about this in relationship to the, what you were trying to, trying to think about the vernacular, the existence of samurai, the yeah. existence of uh, vernacular gloss or vernacular forms of education um, okay. agglomerated. Um, yeah along with the Sanskrit, right? If we're looking at predominantly a cult of the book, predominantly a sacred practice, mm -hmm. there's no reason why it wouldn't all be in Sanskrit. You, you don't have to understand the words, right? Yes, you can just recite. Just like, like you know, yeah. yeah today. Yeah. Who understands? Bali, Nobody. Yeah. Just, you know, yeah. Maybe a few of the monks, but not even. Yeah. Right? So it, exactly. it's about, okay. it's about there's a textual support for oral absorption, but not semantic understanding. Mm -hmm. In that scenario, there's not need for the vernacular until you shift into another kind of learning process. Mm -hmm. So I, I just wonder about that and the distinction between the post onkorian and the onkorian in that way. Because of course, in the post onkorian period, we do have hard evidence of vernacular composition. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in the onkorian period, we don't. Yeah, and you so, know that is the how to say right. the biggest uh, challenges right. which uh, I'm taking, and 
I am not very sure of myself that I can yeah, really it's, prove I mean, it's it because it's yeah, but it yeah. is interesting in in uh, itself. I mean, the the question is so uh, interesting, and uh, until now we have not um, really you know uh, worked on this. We just say okay, uh, oh the Khmer, uh, they they could write good Sanskrit, they could write good Sanskrit poems, you know, like that, and we don't know how many uh, uh, scholars uh, at that time and how and how they learn the Sanskrit because it was not their mother tongue. It, it, it was, uh, how to say, uh, acquired, not, you know, the language was acquired, not uh, innate. I mean, uh, uh, the people uh, could, uh, how to say, could not uh, speak the language the, for the everyday life. And we <coughs> have the example like uh, Yasho Varaman. So his father was, you know, to be a king of the my kingdom so he had to speak the language of the people and also he was the how to say we know that his father was uh, uh, somehow uh, we can say Khmer not Indian not uh, you know uh, foreigner so yeah but the uh, I, I think you might look at the comparison with China uh, for the Pushtak Ashrama, because mm -hmm. if you look at the, bio the official biography of Amogya Vajra, yes. who was the first man, a very successful Buddhist uh, uh, in, in the uh, Tang court, uh, towards the end of his life, when he'd been rewarded by the emperor, he was wealthy, built many monasteries around China, mm -hmm. uh, and the last thing that he did, his favorite project was to build a large building for the books for yeah. all the Buddhist texts, which he, some of which he brought himself from Sri Lanka and other places. And there were rituals that described in that mm. autobi that okay. biography of Amogavadra, where they he would walk around the books ah, every yeah. day in the evening. Of the book. So mm. the veneration of the text the text was yeah. it's a bit like the prophet in Islam, it was it was the word of God almost in uh, in in the text. Although mm -hmm. he was, of course, a great scholar of Sanskrit and a translator into Chinese, as were all his students. I mean, and his students were international from all over Asia, Japan, Java, and uh, and so on. Yes. So uh, they the common language amongst them, rather like the Vatican today, is Latin. You know, Sanskrit, they could actually all speak to each other if, they, if uh, uh, as well as their own language yeah, wouldn't help. And also in, in, in China. So they would all be <laughs> learning some Chinese, but, but they could, among scholars, yeah, converse, speak. Uh, in, in the, but I think there, there, there is a real, a, a different, clear concept of uh, a place for sacred books to mm -hmm. be kept. And I, it looks like, perhaps I can now quit in my class. Okay. Yeah. Thank uh, you I have another question because you've not addressed the classical libraries apart from uh, Prago, uh, um, <coughs> namely the ones in Angkor Wat and the ones in the Bayon, yeah. and also in Cairo yeah, no. and East Bayon. Yeah. Um, what do you think was going on in those buildings? Well, that uh, <laughs> is a very uh, big question, and um, I can just say some sort of a ritual inside, but uh, what sort that uh, we have to really uh, dig out again. And um, I'm also trying to um, see, you know, there are some uh, in inscriptions, uh, we mentioned some uh, rituals, which um, we uh, just uh, call uh, non-identified. So maybe, you know, who knows that one of the non-identified terms for <coughs> rituals maybe uh, related to a book, but frankly speaking, I uh, don't really uh, have the answer to your question that uh, what, uh, um, how to say, activity uh, was there. I've seen some uh, suggestions that it was for vestments, uh, clothing, which mm -hmm. the Brahmins or the, the, the monks would wear in rituals, but also the instruments, the, mm -hmm. the instruments which are used in in, in, in the temple ceremonies, you'd have to keep them somewhere. Perhaps mm -hmm. they, alongside books, <coughs> were kept.
captivities. In, in <coughs> yeah. Or maybe to produce ashes for oh, the, no, <laughs> the passion <laughs> part. Yeah. And ashes That's and very don't go together. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Materials, okay. Hmm. Just out of curiosity, the images that you showed us of the, um, I think there were a set of figures who were uh, looking. The only, oh, the only yeah. books that folks are looking at. And you said you, you wonder if they're books or not. Yes, what, because, what you, you know, it's vertical like that. Mm -hmm. For us, uh, the manuscript should it's be, long. you know, yeah, and you should hold it like this. But, you know, these two, this she, <laughs> just like we are holding iPods uh, <laughs> nowadays. <laughs> I was going to ask you what you thought they were, but okay. <laughs> I, I, I thought, right. But that one may be, well, you know, really like um, the book uh, in the present day. And mm -hmm. I really wonder. Mira? No, I don't think they are narcissists, you know, just to look uh, into, uh, I mean, look at themselves in mirrors like that. No. Yeah, so if you have uh, more ideas. <laughs> else i'm sure you guys have questions there's everybody's just being shy yeah it's always like this shyness come on <laughs> uh, to come back to my literal and figurative question is the even in the the appellation of so-called textbooks yeah so if you take for example vehicle right How do you know that that is designating, in, in what context would you be able to determine that that's designating a particular text or even type of text and not just grammar at large, right? Mm. So the, the term yakarana yeah. can appear, but it takes a very specific context mm -hmm. to say yeah. Therefore, it's a text. It's a, it's a text teaching grammar rather than the notion of grammar Grandma. that I am devoted to, right? And do you, are there means of making that kind of determination? No, in the Sanskrit inscriptions, you know, because um, we would just say, okay, uh, this uh, Brahmin is expert in Vyakarana grammar. Right. So Not and immediately, yeah. you know, we think um, maybe Ashtadhyayi by right. Panini, um, right. just, you know, we do the deduction like that. But um, frankly speaking, if you really want to <laughs> to uh, make sure, then uh, we really have to uh, question each and everything and uh, yeah. that we'll take not only one life but many life to to yeah. see really yeah. what the uh, type of text and also you know when they mean uh, Vyakarana then we have also uh, to uh, bear in mind that maybe they are Vyakarana I mean the uh, Vyakarana uh, known in Cambodia was already different from those in India and we, we have uh, many um, much evidence in uh, because I'm um, uh, doing this with uh, Dr. Chan Luti we know uh, a lot of uh, differences between the medicines you know somehow we, we uh, could detect some uh, differences the, about medi uh, medical science in Cambodia with those in India though you know they just say okay uh, they are experts, they are wiser, they are doctors, they are experts in Ayurveda, but they are, I mean, the Khmer version of uh, Ayurveda 
was different from yeah because and also um uh, astrology for astrology uh, is uh, very uh, important to to know because you know for astrology you have to look uh, at the sky from the place where you you are so somehow you know the the scholars or the astrologers uh, from india they had to really uh, change or uh, use their version of uh, of um, uh, text to ad adapt to the the uh, Cambodian uh, context because you yeah you cannot um, how to say uh, use the uh, knowledge from India like that and uh, then uh, the in in uh, Cambodia it just uh, did not work and also um, for um, how to say some rituals um, in Sanskrit we have this padhati. Uh, you know, like uh, manuals to tell you uh, how to do things. Just like in uh, every um, the present day Cambodia, we have Ajaya, which uh, just uh, guide you. Okay, you have to do this first, then this, 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 and this. Then uh, the I think the Padhati in um, in uh, those days they were also very much uh, localized. Mm. You know, to to the extent that uh, uh, the priests in uh, India, if they uh, came to Cambodia, then they would just say that it's not uh, no longer uh, Shaivism, no longer Vaishnavism, you know. Because, uh, for example, if um, uh, we could not find milk for the ritual, so we had to uh, use other substance to uh, replace this. You know, you don't have that uh, thing uh, as prescribed in the textbook, I mean, in, in the scripture, then you still want to do the ritual, so you have to find uh, ways to to uh, change to just uh, how to say replace. <laughs> yeah, so many many um, uh, things uh, like this happen. I mean, localize localization. Is there any sign of a, <coughs> a copying tradition? I've never seen it in most book cultures like that, where the the, the sacred text comes in in a, an external language. Um, there is a, usually tradition of copying the original yeah. and translating and making copies of that in the translation. But is there in Khmer inscriptions, uh, temple yeah, inscriptions, so, yeah. there's a clear separation. You have san Sanskrit at the top for the gods and then for the management of it in, in old Khmer. And there is, there is, I've never seen any Sanskrit word quoted in the Khmer section. There seems to be a complete separation in, in, in one inscription. So is there any, any indication at all of translating text into uh, old Khmer language? No, and if I understand uh, your question well, you know, it, it is um, only the um, reference to the copying of Sanskrit scriptures you know well the name uh, for example the uh, kashika vritti in um, the foundation stella of uh, banti Sray, then we know that the brother of uh, yajnavara vishnu kumar he he spent you know all his time in copying the kashika vritti and you know kashika vritti then by name we refer to sanskrit text but in which language that uh, they did not uh, tell us so we, we are just uh, frustrated when we read, we wonder whether it was like, you know, the Kashika Viti, the original Sanskrit text, or it was already uh, translated into Khmer, or, you know, half-half, then um, But that is clear in Tibet, you know. and it's clear in China. You've got a big translation yeah, tradition, because they have they, strong they actually tradition of keeping the Tibetan yeah. and the Chinese, and not so much the, the Sanskrit. Uh, but there but, is no indication of this. In it, no, I don't think so. Well, until now, you know, as far as I know, we don't have this uh, indication. I mean, even if you're to take the, <clears throat> and if you're to take the post on Korean as a possible lead into that, then you'd be looking, you're looking at a, you know, a by text kind of thing rather than a veritable translation. You're by text, at, sorry, what do you mean? What people are beginning to call by text. That yeah. is, a, a kind of mixture of. Uh, not necessarily samurai. Well, let's call it samurai. Mm -hmm. So a mixture of um, Pali and, 
and Khmer, Khmer okay. but not a veritable poly text, a poly composition, or mm -hmm. a veritable Khmer composition, but something that is mediated between, between the two. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Which of course characterizes Thai and, and Khmer in that, speaks. in that after in yeah. after the Mon Khmer period. So whether that can be taken as a kind of indication of uh, you want to look I mean, back well, to something very very different from what you see in Tibet, let's say, and from mm. what you see in China, with a, a veritable okay. process of translation. Well, that that yeah. mix is there in old Javanese and Sanskrit. Yeah, they, they are amazing. Well. Yeah, the, the, the library is still there. Mm -hmm. Yes. Anyway, I'm sure there are. We've got a question. <laughs> <laughs> Mia has a question. She always has a question. She just keeps it to herself. <laughs> Every time. Okay, well, Joe, we can we can mill around in here for a little bit if people want to be more informal with their questioning, and um, otherwise maybe we maybe we should wrap up the formal the formal discussion. And thank thank you very much, Pintia, for oh, fascinating thank talk you. and yeah. all of all of that you, that you shared with us. Thank you very oh, much. Thank you. Thank you for thank your, your interest. <laughs>